In this lecture, we're going to focus on one of the most exciting and powerful features that result from projecting global storage as global node objects, the ability to project global storage as a document database. In earlier lectures, I've noted the direct one-to-one -one correspondence between a global and its representation as JSON, as in this example here. However, I've not explained so far how that mapping could be achieved. Well, global node objects have two methods available to them for exactly this purpose. They're named getDocument and setDocument. Let me explain how they work. Suppose we instantiate a top-level global node object for this example global, as represented by the blue rectangle. To create the JSON document on the right from the global on the left, we simply invoke the top-level global node object's getDocument method. And to do the reverse, to create a global on the left that represents and persists the JSON document on the right, we simply invoke the global node object's setDocument method, passing the JSON object as the method's argument. So let's see these two methods in action for real. So let's first look at this script file, globalsdemo6a.js. As you can see, this is going to clear down whatever already is in the global named myglobal and map the contents of this JSON object into it. In doing so, it should recreate the contents of this global that we've been using throughout these lectures and with which you should now be very familiar. So let's run it. And if we check the contents of the global using the mumps shell, you can see that we've created our familiar myglobal contents. By the way, it's worth comparing this method of creating a global with the method we last used where we created the individual leaf nodes by assigning their values. That was this script file, globalsdemo3e.js. I don't know what you think, but my opinion is that the set document approach is much slicker and much more intuitive. Okay, so that was set document. Now let's have a look at this script file, globalsdemo6b.js. As you can see, it's going to invoke the getDocument method for the top-level global node of the global we've just created. So let's see how what it returns compares to what we used to create it in the first place. So let's run it first. And sure enough, if you check back to globalsdemo6a.js, you'll see that the JSON mapped from the global is identical to the JSON we created it from in the first place. Now this capability becomes very interesting and powerful because as you've probably realized, all global node objects have these methods, getDocument and setDocument, available to them. So they can be applied at any level of subscripting within a global. So for example, if we create a global node object for the first subscript with a value of D in this global, as represented by the blue rectangle, then invoking its getDocument method will return the JSON document on the right which, as you can see, represents just the subtree of nodes below the global node. In other words, what's represented by the green rectangle. Let's take a look at this one in action. It's in this script file, globalsdemo6c. So let's take a look. It's going to invoke the getDocument method for the global node representing the first subscript of my global with a value of D. So let's run this. And sure enough, there's the JSON representing just that part of the MyGlobal subtree of nodes. So, okay, what happens if you invoke this global node object set document method using the JSON document on the right? Well, what happens is that the JSON data is added as a new subtree of nodes beneath the specified global node, which in this example means that it adds a new set of subscripts beneath the first subscript D as shown in green. OK, so what happens if the JSON we're injecting into the global duplicates some of the existing subscripts? Like here, this E2 property would map to the already existing second subscript E2. And whilst this F4 property is new, the F3 one already exists in the global. Well, the answer is that the set document is always additive. 
If the mapping of a set of properties is to a new set of global subscripts, then they're added. And if the mapping corresponds to an existing set of subscripts, any existing value will be replaced by the new value in the injected JSON document. And so the value of this D, E2, F3 node is replaced with this new value from the JSON document. But this F4 property gets added under the D, E2 subscript as shown here. Let's try this one out. And here's the script file for this demo, globalsdemo6d.js. And so this will merge the contents of this JSON document into my global under the first subscript D. As in the last slide I showed you, some of these nodes in the JSON document overlap with existing subscripts in the global. To check the results, I'm using get document to retrieve the contents of my global as a JSON document. But notice this use of the parent property. I've used that because it saves me explicitly creating a global node for the top level of my global. Parent returns a global node object representing the immediate level of subscripting above the current one. And in this case, that would be the top level global node. So let's run this. And you can see here the complete new contents of my global with this value replaced and these other properties added. We could, of course, use the mump shell to see what the global now looks like. Let's do that. And as you can see, it's just like I showed you in the presentation slide. Now, sometimes you'll want a destructive process, whereby instead of merging in the new JSON document contents, the subtree of nodes under the specified global node is to be replaced with the JSON document. To do that, you simply invoke the global nodes delete method before its set document method. The delete will destroy the subtree of nodes beneath the specified global node, and then the JSON document's contents will be mapped to a completely new set of nodes beneath the global node. Let's test this one. And it's this script file here, globalsdemo6e.js. And you'll see that it's exactly the same as the previous example, except I've added the delete here. So let's run this. And as you can see in this example, the only nodes beneath the first subscript D is now the contents of the JSON document. OK, so with that, we'll end this lecture. And in the next one, we'll look at how getDocument and setDocument handle arrays. And we'll also explore the advanced features of these two methods.